All right, so today I'm gonna to be answering some of your top questions and we'll be doing this um, from here on out a few times here and there. I'll be answering your top questions from the Myers Way Facebook group um, community. And um, this is a, a private Facebook group for anybody who's following the Myers Way, any one of the programs. So if you're not part of the Myers Way community, you certainly can join the community. It's different than, um, than our regular Facebook page. <clears throat> so if you haven't uh, joined already, you certainly can. Um, just head on over to the Myers Way community and um, tell us hi and come on over. And there's lots of support there. Um, I'll be popping in every now and then and answering questions from over there. My team is there typically to answer questions. There's a lot of people from around the world going through the programs, offering support to one another. Okay, so our first question is from Sharon G. She's asking, is there a gluten-free, dairy-free, and AIP version of keto that is okay for Graves' disease? So I recently published on my blog a whole set of articles about keto, like a ketogenic diet. And very specifically, is it how ketogenic diets can be helpful uh, for people with autoimmunity? So be sure to check out that article. I'm sure my team will post it below as well. So some autoimmune diseases respond very well to ketogenic diets. And I'm going to go over what a ketogenic diet is here in just a quick second. However, um, some or some people don't always respond so well to ketogenic diets. So we'll talk about both of those cases here in a second. So first of all, what is a ketogenic diet? Well, a ketogenic diet is one that is primarily fueling your body from fat. So it's a diet that your body is being fueled from ketones or ketogenesis. So um, primarily we tend to use glucose uh, that typically comes from carbs um, in to run our system, to run our brain, to run our muscles, to you know, fuel our body. However, our body can also run off of ketones. And ketones come when we're kind of in a starvation state to say, you know, lack of a better word. And we used to be in ketosis a lot more when we were back in our hunter-gatherer days because they would eat high protein, they'd eat high fat, there weren't a lot of carbs for them to eat. And, <coughs> excuse me, and there would be times of feast and times of famine. One second. So that's why, you know, many of our ancestors were very lean because, of course, they were wandering around the, you know, the deserts and they were, you know, looking and hunting and gathering food. So they were constantly moving and <coughs> being active and they were not eating high carb and they would go through periods of, of famine as well. And so a lot of people in the paleo community or how this has sort of become a re-emergence of this is like the primal or paleo community, people have looked back to ketogenic diets. <coughs> Excuse me. My daughter was sick recently and we all got it. Um, so in a ketogenic diet, you're eating very high, very, very high fats, moderate amount of protein, and then lower carb. And the ketones, like I mentioned, are used instead of glucose to fuel your body. Now, a ketogenic diet typically is about 80% fat, about 15% protein, and about 5% from carbs. So a normal sort of um, standard American diet is normally around 225 to 325 carbohydrates, which frankly, is a lot and probably a huge reason why we are an obese country these days. If you're somebody who's eating a paleo diet or something like the Myers way, um, you're eating probably between like 100 to 200 carbs a day. So I definitely think that that is, you know, very adequate for many people. Um, some people who want to lose weight, some people who uh, want to decrease inflammation, some people that want to help with things like seizures, um, try out a ketogenic diet. And a ketogenic diet has about 20 to 30 carbs a day. Some moderate keto diets have like 50 carbs a day. You know, one sweet potato, I think it is, has about 30 to 50 carbs. So that tells you how low a carb you're eating when you're doing a ketogenic diet, 20 to 30 carbs a day. Now, 
these, um, a ketogenic diet has been shown to help in certain autoimmune conditions. It's been help, it's been helpful in, um, neurodegenerative. So things like Alzheimer's, dementia, um, MS, um, uh, you know, ALS neurodegenerative autoimmune conditions have been shown in many studies to respond very well to ketogenic diets. Also seizures and epilepsy, very well known in that community in that literature can help with seizure disorders. So it's certainly um, a go-to diet when I'm dealing with any patients in my clinic that have seizures, particularly children is trying to get them on a ketogenic diet. Of course, certainly if you're dealing with blood sugar issues, like diabetes, type one or type two, could potentially be very beneficial there as well. Um, in terms of regulating your blood sugar, losing weight, um, you know, some people report um, more energy, uh, better brain function, um, certainly uh, weight loss, and then of course um, increased muscle mass, decreased fat. And then when you're doing a ketogenic diet, it's also very helpful to help stimulate glutathione which I've written articles about this as well, that glutathione um, has been shown to be consistently low in people with autoimmunity as well as cancers. So um, anything you can do to increase those glutathione levels is always helpful. Now, what I found in the question was super specific to Graves' disease. So Graves' disease, particularly if you're not in um, a situation where your Graves is under control, whether that's through following something like the Myers-Way diet and using the thyroid calming herbs, or um, or that um, you know your if you're doing standard you know conventional medicine treatments like with methamazole, if that is not controlling your um, thyroid symptoms or your thyroid numbers, probably a ketogenic diet's not the best thing in the sense that. You, um, you're already in a hyper metabolic state. And so um, you probably need more carbs. Um, so, um, you know, so you probably need more carbs just so you're not losing weight if, you're, uh, if your thyroid is not being controlled, like I mentioned. So, um, and then I find in general, particularly those of us who have, have had graves, is that those with autoimmune thyroid conditions, the thyroid um, and adrenals go so hand in hand, and it's typically in women more than men. And so I find often that those with Hashimoto's, we already mentioned very specifically about graves, or at least uncontrolled graves, that um, sometimes you can't handle a ketogenic diet because the adrenals are already so stressed. You really need those carbs to help balance out the adrenals. So a ketogenic diet, excuse me, is definitely one of those situations that everybody's an individual. And if you want to give it a try, there are some fabulous benefits to it. Like I've mentioned, weight loss, increased energy, includes glutathione, potentially reversal of uh, seizures and epilepsy, reversal of um, autoimmunity. So these things are all cancer. It's being used in a lot of cancer treatments. Uh, and so it can potentially be helpful in all of these, but you've got to see if you personally can handle a ketogenic diet. I personally have tried one before and I didn't do so well on it, I think because my adrenals um, needed some more carbs. And then if you're a female in where I am, perimenopause, it's sort of fluctuating with the hormones, um, often uh, need carbs there to support that as well. So um, if you are someone who's looking to do a ketogenic diet, just want you to know we um, don't advertise it super well. We've started to recently, but our paleo protein powder and the collagen, our collagen are completely carb free. And so they are approved on a ketogenic diet. So if you are somebody who's looking to try a ketogenic diet, even if you're not trying to try a ketogenic diet, of course, you can use those across all programs. But if you're somebody looking um, interested in ketogenesis or ketogenic diets, um, then you can uh, use our paleo protein powder and also um, collagen. And then just, you know, to make sure you're getting all of the nutrients and whatnot that you need, I highly recommend anybody doing a ketogenic diet that you are taking um, a high quality multivitamin like the Myers Way multivitamin that's meant to support your thyroid. Um, if you're somebody who is a female in perimenopause dealing with thyroid issues and you're trying to um, try out ketogenic diet, I would 
look into um, adrenal support, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have an, uh, some adaptogenic herbs, adrenal support um, supplement that I'd highly recommend. If you're somebody with any type of um, issues breaking down fats, um, digestive enzymes are super helpful. And um, <coughs> liver support can be helpful as well to help your liver breaking down as well as, or keep your liver from breaking down, but helping your liver break down all these fats as well as supporting your uh, making glutathione. So, and then certainly back to uh, you specifically, Shannon G, if you are currently dealing with Graves disease, I highly recommend that you check out my book, the auto, uh, excuse me, the thyroid connection, if you haven't already and follow the program there. I have a program very specifically to help support and reverse Graves disease. So, um, and if helpful, I have successfully helped many people reverse Graves disease following that same program. So if you haven't already looked into that, I'd highly recommend it. Okay, our next question is, and I'll be answering some questions real time live as well. So as you guys are writing in some uh, questions, my, um, <clears throat> my team will write those down for me. Okay, Kitty V, what should we look for when buying meat? Um, she's confused about labels of grass fed, grass finished, all natural, organic. It can be so confusing. It totally can be very confusing. So first off, when, um, you know, in all of my programs, I recommend that you're using grass fed, grass finished, pasture raised meats, um, organic fruits and vegetables. And I understand um, that for some people, um, they don't have access to all of that. And for others, even if they do have access, maybe it's out of their budget. So the first thing that I'd like to say about that is one, it is becoming easier to get organic. It is becoming cheaper to get organic. Um, you know, big box stores like um, Costco are now having lots of organic fruits and vegetables and even, you know, packaged foods. And of course, grass fed, grass finished beef and wild caught salmon and things like that. Target. So there's a lot. You don't have to go to Whole Foods. My favorite choices are Butcher Box for, um, for pasture raised meats and pork and chicken, vital choice for seafood. And my team will post those links if you're interested. We get a butcher box delivered once a month. And so we never even have to leave the house for our, for our food um, or for our meats at least. And then the second thing that I wanna say about it is that when you're going to choose, if you can't choose all organic or all grass fed or, or pasture raised, Meats are the first place that I recommend that you, you know, spend your money because they're higher up on the food chain. And so when something's higher up on the food chain, then it is eating everything lower and you are getting whatever it ate. So it's more important to try, if you can, to buy grass fed, grass finished beef than it is, say, you know, celery, for example. Now, when it comes to fruits and vegetables, if you don't have access to all organic or you can't afford it, I definitely recommend, um, <clears throat> I would definitely recommend that you look at the EWG um, Dirty Dozen and Clean 13. So that will tell you that certain fruits and vegetables are, um, certain fruits and vegetables are more important than others to get organic based on the pesticide load. So, um, so celery, for example, is a very high pesticide vegetable. And so I do recommend trying to get it organic, whereas something like blueberries are not nearly as high. And so if you had to choose between organic strawberries or organic blueberries, um, then I would get organic strawberries and get conventional blueberries. And so that EWG is a great place to go to, um, you know, to know kind of which ones you can get organic and which one's conventional. Okay. So back to the question, um, it is super confusing. You want, if at all possible, grass-fed and grass-finished. So if you get just grass-fed meat, um, it can be fed in its final, um, it can be called grass-fed and grain-finished, which means it gets all those GMO grains of soy and corn at the end of its life. And it can still be called grass-fed if it does that. So the main thing is you want grass-fed and grass-finished. Now, grass-fed has more omega-3s than, say, a grain-fed cow does, almost five times as much as um, linoleic acid, which is, you know, helps to fight inflammation. So one of the theories behind why 
many people have way more omega-6s than omega-3s is from all the meat that they're eating and conventionally made raised meat. However, if you're getting grass-fed, grass-finished meat, then um, you're getting a lot more omega-3s um, than you are omega-6s. And so it helps. So that helps to fight inflammation, helps with the immune system. Um, anytime that you're getting something, so grass-fed, grass-finished is like, you know, the supreme. The next thing would just be grass-fed, grain-finished. Then the next would be USDA organic. So USDA organic ensures that there's no hormones, no antibiotics, and that they're not ever fed GMOs. So that's kind of the, the tier. And then all natural would be, you know, the next tier, which is, again, no hormones, no antibiotics given. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, would be conventional. So that's how I would think of it. Grass-fed, grass-finished, pasture-raised, grass-fed, grain-finished, organic, all-natural, conventional. So that's how I would rank those in terms of, you know, best way to, to do that. Okay, um, Julie H. would like to know, is peanut oil allowed on the 30-day protocol? Well, um, peanuts in and of themselves are a legume and can be ridden with mold and can be highly inflammatory for a lot of people. So in general, I don't recommend peanuts. And then when you try to extract oils like you do from peanut oil, it's really highly processed and they have to use a lot of chemicals in order to get the oil extracted, which leads to both chemicals in the oil and the extraction process means that it makes it really highly inflammatory. Then a lot of oils, um, industrial seed oils, which is what we'll call this, you know, are then stored in big, big vats of plastic. And then it, because it's a fat, it extracts the, the chemicals toxic chemicals from the plastic. So the nice thing about a peanut oil, for example, or a corn oil or a soy oil and why they're so widely used um, is that they are have super high smoke points, which means that they can be deep fried or things can be deep fried in them. They can be used you know, at super high heats to cook stuff, to make packaged foods. And so <clears throat> that can be super great when you're trying to make packaged foods. Um, however, when you get the oil heated that high, it breaks down and it releases even more toxins. So in general, I don't recommend industrial seed oils. Um, I have um, a whole section all on the different oils that I recommend in my cookbook, The Autoimmune Solution. There's a whole chapter just on ingredients to use and why I chose those ingredients. So some of the oils that I use to cook with, generally in my own home, as well as in the Autoimmune Solution cookbook, are of course, y'all know coconut oil. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, likely olive oil, which has a lower smoke point. Avocado oil is a new one coming on the market. Um, we use a lot in our house. We eat a lot of bacon. So we use the leftover oil from bacon. Um, Epic has come out with various, um, you know, lard and tallow and things that you can buy if you're not cooking those things in your house and don't have leftover um, oils from that. Uh, Desert Farms has come out with a new uh, fat is called hump fat and it comes from camels. You know, it's really nice about that is that it doesn't really impart any flavor. Same thing with palm shortening. If you use those, you know, coconut flavor, olive oil, avocado oil, even, you know, bacon grease have certain flavors to them. So palm shortening really has no flavor. Hump fat really has no flavor. So those are really good things to cook with or, um, you know, they have high uh, smoke points. So if you do want to try to fry something, um, <coughs> then, um, you know, it's not going to have a flavor imparted on it. And they have really sm uh, high smoke points. So those are really good. Toasted sesame oil, I don't cook with too much. It can be um, used at a very low heat, but it has a very low smoke Point. So I use, you know, more drizzling that on salads and things to have that kind of nutty, toasty flavor of an Asian salad or something afterwards. And then if you're a person who can tolerate um, some ghee, ghee is a fabulous fat to cook with. And I personally do tolerate some ghee. And so 
that's something that, um, so, um, that, you know, we use frequently in our house is ghee. If you've gone through the program and you know that you can tolerate that and that's clarified butter. So it has the whey and the casein proteins, um, cooked out of it. <clears throat> so again, my book, the autoimmune solution cookbook walks you through the different types of oils that I recommend. Um, I even have recorded some videos about choosing healthy fats. Um, I also um, made some videos about gluten-free and grain-free flours and other staples that I use in this cookbook. So what I love about this cookbook, besides the fact that it's all brand new recipes, 150 recipes, um, what wasn't around when I wrote the autoimmune solution were things like cassava flour and tiger nut flour and some of the other flours that, um, and products, oils, fats, flours, um, just ingredients really, you know, three years ago were not very mainstream and it made cooking and baking in an autoimmune way much more difficult. It's sort of like, you know, 10 years ago where gluten-free was. So now autoimmune paleo, paleo is super easy to make. You know, we even have pizza recipe here. We have dessert recipes. So um, <clears throat> the book has incredible recipes uh, for pancakes and uh, muffins and uh, gingerbread cake. If you've been watching me on Instagram, how much my family, um, Elle, myself, my dog, everybody loves the gingerbread cake. We keep making it over and over in our household. So it's a huge hit. So there are lots and lots of recipes um, <clears throat> that for things that I didn't include in the autoimmune solution or the thyroid connection, just because those flowers and ingredients were not widely available. And now that they're so widely available, um, it makes e you know cooking those comfort foods that we all want so much easier. And so this cookbook includes a lot of those things. And I know a lot of people are tired of coconut flour, allergic to coconut flour. And um, Nancy's asking, she sure hopes to have egg-free recipes. Every recipe in the cookbook is egg-free. We use gelatin in place of eggs in all of the recipes that require eggs for baking. So I recently recently released a gelatin on my website as well to help make your autoimmune cooking much easier, cooking and baking. So, um, <clears throat> and somebody's asking what tiger nuts are. They're little tubers. So they're, um, you know, they come from the ground and they're a tuber, um, but they have the consistency of a, um, of almost like a um, oatmeal or, you know, a flake. Um, but anyway, what I was saying is a lot of people are tired or can't tolerate um, coconut flour. And so one of the biggest asks that I got about this cookbook was to not use so much coconut because everybody's either, you know, over coconut, oversaturated with coconut or can't tolerate coconut. So we have so many um, other flour choices now that are gluten and grain free that we use throughout the cookbook. And don't forget, if you um, are interested in purchasing the cookbook, pre-ordering it before now on May 8th, um, you can head to amymd.io forward slash AI cookbook, order your copy and get 150 bucks in free gifts. Okay, so our next question, Atwalia says she can't wait to get the cookbook. Um, awesome, thanks so much. Okay, KDM, KDM, how do I know which one of your probiotics is right for me? Okay, this is a great question. So I typically use the 100 billion probiotics for anybody who's looking to overcome leaky gut, candida, any kind of dealing with a current gut issue. You're new to the program, you um, recently got diagnosed with autoimmunity, something like that, 100 billion is what I use. You're overcoming a parasite, you're overcoming candida. I'm gonna talk about how I don't use it for SIBO in just a second, but candida, leaky gut, um, irritable bowel, IBS, you know, one of these things, 100 billion is where I start for almost everybody in any one of my programs. Once you feel like your gut is healed, you've recovered from the candida, you are in maintenance phase, then I recommend the 30 billion uh, unit probiotic capsules for anybody in maintenance phase. And it's what I um, use in what's called my essentials kit that includes a multivitamin, fish oils, probiotics, and vitamin D and K. Now, if you're somebody who's dealing with um, SIBO, uh, I recommend our newest 
uh, probiotic, which is Primal Earth Probiotic. And this is a soil-based probiotic. Now, we seem to be missing this in our modern day times because we're not playing in the dirt like we used to and we're sanitizing everything and washing everything. And you know, we used to walk out in the back and pull up a carrot and eat the carrot and you know, maybe rinse it off and eat the carrot. Now, by the time you get the carrot at the store, you know, it's been washed multiple, multiple times, even in bleach and other things to really kill everything. So um, the soil-based probiotic is what I recommend to anybody dealing with SIBO. Now, something like, you know, 67% of people with IBS, or maybe it's even up into the 70s with IBS, have SIBO. And 54% of people with Hashimoto's have SIBO. This is so common. I see SIBO all the time in my clinic. It's probably the number one or number two gut infection right there with candida. So SIBO is um, an overgrowth of good bacteria in your small intestine. So we normally have a little bit of back, good bacteria there, but when we get too much of it there, then we have a problem. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So one of the bacteria that overgrows is lactobacillus, that good bacteria, the one that's in my other probiotics. But if you already have an overgrowth of a good bacteria, the last thing you want to do is add fuel to the fire. So instead, if you're dealing with SIBO, then I recommend you don't take uh, the 30 or the 100 billion, and instead you take the soil-based probiotic here. <clears throat> and, um, and this one, just one capsule a day. So it doesn't add fuel to the fire. There's also some studies um, looking at soil-based probiotics and in, in people with autoimmunity and soil-based probiotics can increase IgA, which is your immune system in your gut. And many people who have autoimmunity have low IgA. It also helps to support your gut repair pathways. And of course, like all of my probiotics, short of the one for infants, it does not need to be refrigerated. Now, my infant probiotic is the one that I started, um, that I created and started carrying when Elle was born. She's taken this since the first day of her life and still takes it today. So this is specifically formulated from birth to the first two years of life. We have different bacteria in our gut um, the first two years of life. And so this is very specific uh, to an infant, you know, just born to two years of life. So this is what I'd recommend. This does need to be refrigerated. It's a powder. And if you're a woman who's breastfeeding, you can just put it on your breast as your baby goes to breastfeed. And if you're pumping or you're giving, um, you know, a bottle or doing camel's milk or whatever you're doing, you can put it right into the bottle, which is what we did uh, for L. I will be doing these Ask Dr. Myers episodes periodically. So if you're interested in having your question answered, please be sure to join the Myers Way community, which is a private Facebook group community, which is where we will be pulling the questions from. And now I'm going to answer a few uh, questions that have come in live. <coughs> okay. I take Morgan. I take several supplements and I'm wondering what the best method to maximize absorption. Should I spread them out or should I take them with food? So Morgan, that is um, a question that is multifaceted. So if you're taking a something for detox, like a charcoal or liver protect or, um, or, um, glutathione, you'd want to take that on an empty stomach. That makes it absorb better. If you're taking something like the multivitamin or the fish oils or vitamin D, you'd want to take that with food because it helps to get absorbed better. Um, if you're taking something like B vitamins, um, they're not necessarily absorbed better with food, but some people get nauseous when they take B vitamins. So um, it um, really depends. And I see people tagging people, which is super awesome. Make sure you put this, the at sign and directly their name, and then you should be able to find them on Facebook and then tag them, like their profile ought to show up and tag them, and then it should turn blue, okay? <coughs> um, so it really depends on what kind of supplement you're taking as to um, whether you should take them on an empty stomach, with food, without food, doesn't matter. So certain things, it doesn't matter. Certain things, um, fat-soluble curcumin, um, fish oils, vitamin D, those are all better multivitamin absorbed with food. Things for detox are better absorbed without food. 
Um, so if you have super specific questions, you can always set up a wellness coaching session with my registered dietitian, uh, Dana, if you're interested. Um, Chris would like to know, can I try glutathione even if I don't have thyroid dysfunction or leaky gut? Absolutely. So um, glutathione is the biggest detoxifier in our body. And we are all, uh, well, I shouldn't say we're all deficient, but we all do live in a, in a very toxic world these days. Some of us don't produce glutathione very well and other people produce it better. So I feel like it's just one of those safety measures. It's like, you know, um, well, I mean, I would say like, you know, wearing your seatbelt every day is to take glutathione every day because we live in a super toxic world. And then obviously if you do already have an autoimmune condition or something like that, even more so, or if you've done a genetic test on yourself, like 23 and me, and you know that you don't produce glutathione well, like myself, I mean, sure. I definitely take one. Sarah, I would like to know, can you follow a ketogenic diet if you have histamine intolerance? So there's absolutely no reason that you can't follow a ketogenic diet if you have a histamine intolerance. You just need to be super careful about what of the foods on a ketogenic diet you can tolerate or not. So some of the things like avocado can be high in histamine and it's a fat. So in a lot of people on a ketogenic diet to get their fats up, eat a lot of avocados. Um, obviously meat and bone broths and things like that can be high histamine as well. So histamine intolerance is different for everybody in terms of, you know, how much histamines can you tolerate versus not. If you can eat a lot of coconut oil or ghee or something like that, that isn't going to affect your histamines, certainly you can be doing a ketogenic diet. <clears throat> and then if you're somebody who can tolerate eggs, um, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of dairy, but on a regular ketogenic diet, not an autoimmune ketogenic diet, you know, they allow dairy on it. Mila, uh, my thyroid was removed due to a goiter. I'm not, sh I'm not, I'm not sure I had an autoimmune condition. Does it make sense to follow your protocol anyway? Um, yeah, Mila. I mean, I don't know the reason for your goiter, but many goiters, um, some are iodine deficiency, others are inflammatory goiters. So likely there was an autoimmune process going on. Even if you had your thyroid removed, you may still have antibodies. So you could ask your doctor to check you for antibodies anyway. Um, and then you could know if you did have an autoimmune condition. But um, my program isn't, I mean, yes, it's designed for people with autoimmunity, but it's not gonna hurt you if you don't have autoimmunity to follow the program. In fact, you know, I always tell people, if you have another condition, you could just take out the word autoimmune and put in your condition, you know, diabetes, um, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, and, and do the program and likely it's going to help you in some way, if not completely, uh, by following that program. <clears throat> um, Twalia wants to know, she recently had an elevated cholesterol done. Does coconut oil and coconut milk contribute to that? So typically it does not. There are some people who have familial hypercholesterolemia and I've seen it in my clinic where eggs and other things that um, are highly saturated fats do affect their cholesterol. It's not a lot of people. It is possible, but it's rare. So what you could do, likely what I see with cholesterol is carbs are what is rising your cholesterol. And also cholesterol is not just your cholesterol number. I mean, you need to look at your triglycerides. You need to look at HDL, LDL. You need to look at your particle size. So your total cholesterol number really doesn't matter. It's really what the particle size of your cholesterol is doing. So super important to have your doctor check that. And then you can just, you know, add in coconut oil, um, check your cholesterol, do a trial, take out the coconut oil, check your cholesterol, see if you're one of those people who is affected by that. But most people are not. I mean, I cannot speak to your personal condition, but most are not. Okay, everybody, I just wanted to say thanks so much for joining. Again, come on over and join the Myers Way community, and I will per uh, periodically be answering your questions on Facebook Live. All right, everybody, take care. Have an awesome day, and don't forget to pick up a copy of your Autoimmune Solution Cookbook. Talk to you soon. Take care.